regardless of your political ideology, um, it was violent. It really happened. This week in Pennsylvania, on the anniversary of the January 6th riots, a D.C. Capitol policeman who was seriously injured comes to the state capitol with a warning that it could happen again. The state legislature fulfilled its constitutional obligation to meet in Harrisburg in January. It was a brief pit stop, but their to-do list is long. And the State Farm Show is underway in Harrisburg, celebration of all things agriculture and a few tasty treats as well. Hello, Happy New Year to you. Welcome to This Week in Pennsylvania. I'm Dennis Owens. We are covering hot topics in PA policy and politics, as well as the issues that are important to you and your family. Lawmakers briefly, and I mean briefly, fulfilled their constitutional duty and met in Harrisburg on the first Tuesday of the year. I, Kim I, Ward, Kim Ward, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support Senator Kim Ward, the first woman to hold the office, once again elected president pro tempore of the, the Senate United unanimously. The Over in the House, no elections, but they did meet per the Constitution. The next big event in Harrisburg is the governor's budget address, February 6th. After that, they don't return until mid-March. One of the biggest items on the to-do list, funding for public schools that courts have ruled is unconstitutionally inequitable. Some estimate, estimate, and many Democrats, want an additional $6 billion. Republicans want to make sure whatever the number is, it's money well spent. How do we know that a, a student is successful until they leave the building in which they've been educated and become productive citizens? Ultimately, that's what we're all about, right? We can't wait another year. I think we have to take steps to be able to address it right now, because every year we wait, put some of our students across Commonwealth further behind, and that's not what we need to do. The Basic Education Funding Commission, which has been studying the problem for months, will issue its report Thursday. That's a big deal and much anticipated. Also a big deal, Sherelle Parker, former state rep, is sworn in as mayor of Pennsylvania's biggest city. She is Philadelphia's 100th mayor and its first woman. She promised bold steps to transform the city and declared a public safety emergency that must be addressed. History was also made on the other side of the state. I, Sarah Enamorado. I, Sarah Inamorato, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. A lot of swearings in. Former state execute. rep Sarah Inamorato, first woman sworn in as Allegheny County Executive. She is a progressive Democrat who joked that she's also the first person with tattoos to hold that office. Her first action? Giving all county employees a pay raise. President Biden was scheduled at Valley Forge Friday afternoon as we tape this to kick off his campaign, arguing that democracy is on the ballot this year and using the battlefield as a backdrop, reminding voters about January 6th and blaming former President Trump for the riots. A new lawsuit also blames Republican Congressman Scott Perry from central Pennsylvania for playing a role in the attack on the U.S. Capitol, and it seeks to remove him from the ballot. Perry has not been charged with wrongdoing, but his cell phone was seized by the feds as part of its investigation. His campaign calls the lawsuit frivolous, brought by a, quote, fringe activist. Our legal analyst is a former federal judge. He calls the situation a mess and attempts to remove candidates, including President Trump, from ballots, citing the 14th Amendment needs to be settled by higher courts and quickly. The Constitution um, can be... Um, somewhat undemocratic at times, but it, it, we are a nation of laws, and somebody's going to have to interpret what this particular law means, and that usually falls to the Supreme Court. Every single Perry's running for a seventh term. A large field of Democrats has entered the race, hoping to oppose him in November. Very rare move in the state Senate is Democrat Art Haywood called for an ethics committee investigation into Republican Senator Doug Mastriano for his alleged role in events leading up to and including January 6th. Mastriano was at the U.S. Capitol that day, previously chaired a hearing questioning the legitimacy of the 2020 election. That he was part of a large, angry, armed, violent mob that was assembled to the Capitol for the purpose of overturning the election. Mastrano and Sissy played no role in the violence. Senate ethics complaints by a sitting member against another sitting member are so rare that no one can remember the last time it happened. In a statement, Mastriano dismissed Haywood's ethics complaint as, quote, a partisan PR stunt. 
Well, there is still debate about what actually happened that day and why, and conspiracy theories persist. But this week in the PA Capitol, I spoke with a policeman who was seriously injured that day trying to hold the line at the U.S. Capitol. He worries that conditions that led to the riots have still not been fixed in this country, and it could happen again. What you saw unfold before your very eyes on television is what happened. And this is what unfolded before Michael Fanon's eyes. Video from his body cam shows the D.C. police officer beaten by the mob, even tased in the neck. And as a result, I suffered a heart attack and a traumatic brain injury. Fanon says equally traumatic, the flames of electoral mistrust continue to be fanned as another device of election looms. Same rhetoric, the same lies that inspired the January 6th insurrection uh, continue to be um, spoken by members of one political so party. Indeed, a recent AP poll shows nine in 10 Democrats describe January 6th as, quote, very violent, but only three in 10 Republicans do. Fanon's reaction? That's Regardless of your political ideology, it was violent. It really happened. It was supporters of the former president uh, and a lot of police officers were hurt uh, in the process. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. Fanon is tattooed, likes to fish and hunt, self-described redneck from Virginia who voted for Donald Trump in 2016. The former president denies any wrongdoing and insists he played no role in that riot. Fanon insists otherwise. Absolutely, 100%. What's even crazier to me is um, how he has doubled down on that rhetoric in the aftermath. Now retired from police work, Fanon wrote a book about that day and visited the state capitol as part of an educational tour, he says, to alert Americans that it could happen again. You know, steer clear of these conspiracy theories. People just need to listen to the facts. Moving now to a lighter topic, agriculture, big business in PA. And the annual farm show is underway at the building called the farm show. That's right, it is both an event and a place. It runs for eight days, celebrates all things ag. The traditional butter sculpture was unveiled this week. It's a thousand pounds of butter and this year's sculpture called A Table for All, Pennsylvania Dairy Connects Communities. It will be on display along with animals, farm machinery, and of course, lots of tasty treats. Coming up, we're going to talk about the importance of agriculture in Pennsylvania with the guy who oversees it all, Secretary Russell Redding. Stay with us. And welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. It is Farm Show Week, as we've been telling you, and I'm joined now by the man at the center of it all, Agriculture Secretary Russell Redding. Full disclosure, you were at the Farm Show. You ran over here to do this show, and you're going to go back to the Farm Show. But for Pennsylvanians who are out there who have never been to the Farm Show, why should they go? Well, think about it as, as, you know, agriculture is one of these things that we touch every day, right? Uh, we, we go to our refrigerator and expect food to be there. We go to our food bank and, and expect food to be there. We expect the lands to be productive. You know, we, that all comes together inside the business of ag. We try to celebrate that, honor that this week, recognize the people who do it, who, who make the investments, but also how important it is to the quality of life of Pennsylvania and our economy. It doesn't magically appear in grocery stores? Uh, it would be easy, uh, <laughs> easier times if it were, so, yeah. How important is, let's talk business, how yeah. important is agriculture to Pennsylvania's economy? You know, it's 18% of the state's gross uh, domestic product. It's $132 billion a year, 600,000 jobs, you know, from production through retail. Uh, it's a significant piece of, of Pennsylvania's economy. What is the biggest concern facing farmers and agriculture in Pennsylvania in 2024? It's a business. Right? So all of these headwinds that we read about and think about, you know, with inflation and trade and what gets through canals and all of that is a part of this conversation we're having this week. Uh, and of course, workforce, uh, I've had a half a dozen conversations today about immigration, about how do I find the tech t teams that I need or they need. Um, so trade and workforce are the big issues. I also wonder if I'm a, a young guy, now farming is one of those things that's handed down from generation to generation, but I'm sitting on a a plot of land that somebody's going to give me a lot of money to build houses on. So, A, I don't have to go do that hard work of the farm anymore, and somebody's going to give me a big paycheck. I'm surprised more and more people don't do it. Are they doing that, and does that concern you? I, I'm always concerned about it. I mean, I, this is a state that, you know, 25 years ago, 
you know, ask the citizens of Pennsylvania to indebt itself to preserve prime agricultural lands. We lead the nation in preserve farms. Uh, 6,300 families have said yes to that. Uh, the, the easiest day in agriculture is the day you plant something, right? It's always going to be work. It always has been work. But when I look around the state, I mean, we've got more young farmers under the age of 35 than any other state in the nation. But the average age of farmers in Pennsylvania? 65. So transitions have to occur, a lot of land in transition. The next 10 years will be critical. And, and quickly, and, and tell me, yeah. so we spend money to preserve farmland, we give the money to those farm people, and then, but they can't then turn it into developments. Is that the deal? Uh, they carry a deed restriction that says this farm will be a productive agricultural asset in perpetuity. Uh, let's talk about avian flu, which I think is one of the concerns. We were kind of devastated by it, what, a year ago, and I guess just in, in late December, there was a pheasant in Northumberland County with a confirmed case. We won't see any birds at the farm show as a precautionary measure, right, uh, yeah. for spraying. Tell us what it is and how concerning that is. Well, it's, it's interesting. It, it, this all played out two days before Christmas, right? We thought we were out of the woods, you know, as the birds are migrating. You know, the birds are as, are as confused as we are. Uh, they, they are gone later. Uh, their, their patterns are different. It moves. This virus is still circulating. We thought this would die out. Uh, before the birds migrated again, it's back. Uh, so we're on high alert in Pennsylvania, $7 billion industry, a lot of farms. That's, just, that's farms. the poultry part of that's it. That's just poultry piece. Uh, how does that spread and how do you stop it from spreading? Because, uh, you know, obviously birds fly over land all the time. Yeah, they do. So this is about you know, good biosecurity and biosecurity means you don't, don't track it anywhere. Uh, if you work on these poultry farms, you, you shower in, you shower out. Uh, if you're going in and out those farm lanes, you're, doing, you're cleaning those trucks. Uh, you're making sure that your employees aren't carrying it into the convenience store for somebody else to take. All of that is a biosecurity concern. Has to be painful when you see, though, that when, when it's discovered, you know, we're just going to destroy thousands and thousands of birds. Uh, it is difficult. We've done it 71 times uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've done a thousand farms across the United States. It continues to circulate. and There's nothing more uh, disappointing and sad and anxious to know. Uh, that you've been an effective farm. And on top of that, uh, you're going to be out of that business for a while. That's why the state, both the governor and the legislature, responded with a recovery fund to help bridge between the positive birds and impact and getting it back in got, business. Got to be aggressive, though, right? Absolutely yeah. aggressive. I have a question from the Smith family, which owns a farm in Pine Grove. And they say, we've waited years for a broadband option that has not yet arrived. Can the government change course and provide subsidies to install and operate the new Starlink technology so that rural Americans can have the benefits of high-speed Internet at a reasonable cost with those who already have low-cost broadband? So that question, but also the importance, because people might not think about it, this farm likes to try to do business via the Internet, selling some yep. of its products, mm -hmm. and, and has real spotty service. So broadband is an important, rural broadband is an important thing. But what do, you, what do you say to that? Well, I don't know the specifics of, of the, you know, the technology there, but the, the, uh, you know, having broadband access at the speeds required to do business as required uh, is part of what the governor and, and, and the Broadband Development Authority is doing. It's the billion dollar investment the federal government is making in Pennsylvania. Uh, so their point is well made. Uh, we need to get it done, and, and, and you know, otherwise, that farm, difficult to manage, difficult to transition. But there's, another, but there's another part, and maybe this is more for the people doing the broadband stuff, the question right. of using a different kind of technology, Starlink, which is satellite-based and doesn't necessarily require you to run lines to every house. Yeah, this has come up around the state. Yeah. I, I don't know the specifics of why and where that fits and, and whether it's allowed inside the broadband. And what are farmers asking you? What do you see as your top job uh, to help them? Mm -hmm. Uh, two things. Uh, one uh, is around permits. Uh, environmental permitting, you know, the governor sort of laid that out as a priority in the first term. Success uh, to date, uh, but more to do around the environmental permitting and making it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing, right? Number two, uh, this is a business, as I noted. I mean, you've got to keep investing. You've got to find money and resources. That's got to be, you know, access to capital, markets, and people. Uh, so investing in them, getting whatever they want to do done uh, from a building standpoint. And then I think uh, importantly, and the farm show sort of brings this home, is the importance of that connectedness between people who produce food and fiber in the state and those who are consuming it. That linkage is critical. I'm much better at consuming it, I have found. Uh, <laughs> two quick questions. In these yes. deeply partisan times, you know it is politically. You've managed to bridge the political divide. You were appointed by Republican Governor Tom Corbett, stayed on with Democrats Tom Wolf and Josh Shapiro. How have you been, and what's your secret in these partisan times, navigating yeah, those waters. Uh, I, I've lived by the rule to put the problem first and the politics second. 
right? There are folks who want to put politics first and problems second, then you have two problems, right? <laughs> In my simple world, one's better than two when it comes to problems. That's good arithmetic. Yeah. Who's your favorite governor? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to make it easier. What's your favorite farm Shapiro. show? What, what's your favorite farm show food? You know, I, I have uh, come to appreciate an apple dumpling. Okay. Yeah, it, it is uh, wonderful. Can Warm. we roughly call it hel healthy? Uh, with some ice cream. In it. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to like the mushroom burgers. They're delicious, and there's yeah. new stuffed mushrooms that, that are sensational. The farm show, by the way, going until Sunday next That's week. Yep. You're going to be there a lot. Thanks so much for being with day. us today. Appreciate Happy it. New Year. Russ Thank Redding, you. thanks so much. Stay with us. Much more this week in Pennsylvania when we come back. Well, welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania, our first new show of the new year. Uh, our analyst, Danielle Gross, ClearPoint Communications, Christopher Nicholas of the Eagle Consulting Group. Thanks for all you guys do making this show what it is. We certainly do appreciate it. Uh, well, the third anniversary of the January 6th attacks at the U.S. Capitol. I'm fascinated by what seems to be a partisan divide on exactly what happened. Nine in ten Democrats call that event violent, but only three in ten Republicans believe that. If the bitter partisan divide is the fuel that ignited January 6th, has that been fixed in this country as here we are in election year? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't understand how anyone can see the footage. If it was their loved one who was being attacked, if it was their loved one who worked in, in the Capitol, uh, I don't know how you can say that that's not a violent event. It period. was a violent event. Not everyone there participated in the violence, so you have to be careful about that. Yep. But when you see people's heads being bashed in, mm -hmm. and as I remind people, how many days are there in a presidential term? Like 1,300 or something? That was the one day where the Joint Congress meets to take the election results mm -hmm. and certify them. So if this had happened on March 19th or July 18th, that's something else, but it was specifically on that day. But can you speak to what the apparent skepticism is among a lot of Republicans when they see the reports of what happened and they, they are somewhat dismissive, even though we just did a story earlier in this show with a police officer who was seriously injured that day, who was a self-described redneck who voted for Donald Trump in 2016? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, there's gotta be some cognitive dissonance when you look at the footage and say it's not violent. Again, not everybody there was violent. Most people there were not, but there was way too much violence, and it's right on camera, it's right on film. And you, the, the, the most difficult footage to look at is the members of the House and Senate inside as mm -hmm. it was happening. Almost cowering. As they were trying to get yeah. well, they somewhere. They were literally saying, get them, let's kill them. Well, <laughs> so President Biden will make campaign stops at various historic sites. This is part of his campaign uh, strategy, beginning with Valley Forge, which is a famous yes, battle. It's his continuing push. strategy to only campaign well, in he wants to. Well, he wants else. to make the case that democracy is on the ballot. Is it? Or uh, if that is your number one issue, you are no doubt voting for the Democrat. If that, uh, but to Republicans, it's probably farther down the ballot. I mean, tell me, tell me what's the political... Uh, I, I think democracy is always on the ballot because we are a nation of elections, but we only have one national election, and that's once every four years. So presidential elections among all of our many elections are unique. Even though it's 51 different state elections, it's the closest thing we have to a national election. But will that resonate with independent voters who it may not be their most important uh, it, thing? It, it resonates more with independent voters. That's what we keep seeing. Yeah. Where it doesn't resonate is with folks who have been inundated with misinformation and disinformation. What misinformation is when you say things that aren't right by accident, and disinformation is when you actively try to create an alternate reality. Um, and a lot of these folks have been targeted to receive a lot of that said misinformation and disinformation. Our reality reality is that we have to take a quick break. <laughs> we'll be right back. Stay with us. And welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. More with our analysts, Christopher and Danielle. What do you make of attempts by some to remove candidates? Congressman Scott Perry, Donald Trump on that whole uh, 14th Amendment ground saying that if you took an oath of office and you're involved in an insurrection, you can't hold office. Neither of them, by the way, we should point out, has been even charged with insurrection. Yeah, I, I think there's the rub. They haven't been charged. They haven't been convicted. Of course, the 14th Amendment doesn't say you have to be charged or convicted. So I think I speak for all of us in politics when we say, please, Supreme Court, 
figure this out for us. U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Right. Supreme Court. Because that's where uh, they have to say yay or nay. Uh, you know, that old saying, politics abhors a vacuum. And right now we have a vacuum. Uh, and is it okay? Like in Maine, they knocked Trump off. Their Secretary of State's not even elected. It's appointed like ours by the Democratic governor. In Colorado, where it happened, at least that person is an elected Secretary of State, so they can suffer the consequences or not. At well, the and that in Maine, I know that secretary has pictures of herself with Obama and with Biden, and uh, so well, certainly it just feeds the the narrative. <laughs> well, that, to, uh, to me, I think it's really interesting seeing the the same people who are arguing that the that it's not constitutional or that it's an in, interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, are kind of arguing against being originalists in the Constitution when the same people talk about how they want to adhere to the Constitution and a lot of things. It's some very interesting mental gymnastics happening. Yeah, I don't happening. think it's just one type of people that go back yeah. and forth on how they interpret the Constitution depending on which amendment it is. So I hope the Supreme Court takes it up quickly, lets us know. As it is now, Trump was never, or any Republican, was never going to win Colorado, so that's not a big deal. Yeah, but in the primary, it kind of does matter, right? Because there's other candidates, well, right? It matters in the Electoral it College. Matters, no. But in Maine, they're one of the few states that grant electoral votes by winning the state and winning one of their districts. two congressional districts. So even though the state might go Democratic, the one congressional district, so that one would actually cost Republicans an electoral college vote. Colorado, again, like is kind of in the rear view window. Real quickly, we have 30 seconds. This week, the Basic Education Funding Commission, we've been talking about the, the funding of schools, they're going to release a report on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Kind of a big deal. What should we be looking for? Yeah, we should be looking for uh, the Governor Shapiro and the Democrats in the Senate to talk about what they want to spend on education. And, uh, and, and it, I'm told that if they don't spend enough, they could be back in court. They'll be back in court. All right. That's all the Democrats say, Dennis. We don't spend enough on Thanks education. Thanks for joining us on This Week in Pennsylvania. <laughs>